Hello, welcome to New Harvest Christian Fellowship, Manchester, England, and thank you for subscribing to our sermon podcast. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. We pray it will be a blessing to your life, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, we'll give you our contact information at the end of the recording. Thank you once again. Enjoy the preaching. Yes. 1 Kings Can I just make a quick announcement? Keep your church clean. <laughs> Our church should be clean all the time. You know, when you go into McDonald's, somebody goes to McDonald's? Anybody go to McDonald's? A few of you? Okay. Yeah. Anybody go to K? Yeah, yeah, you go. You just don't want to admit that you go. That's what it is. How many goes to Kentucky Fried KFC? Do you go to KFC? All right. You go to fast food places. When you go there and it's just a tip, right? You're just like, ah, I don't like it. Uh, when, when the tables are dirty or something, it's just not quite good, is it? It's, it's not very good. Grace and I were doing some shopping several months ago, and uh, we went into, uh, I won't say the name of the place, but it's a place that serves coffee and sweets, and we sat down, and we wanted to have coffee and a sweet after the day of shopping, and as we went in there, uh, the table that we wanted to sit at was sticky, and it was like, it had stuff all over, and we asked the, the girl who is paid to clean tables, can you please clean our table, and she's like, and gave us attitude, never cleaned our table, never cleaned our table, and we were like, I ain't going there no more, you know, just all we wanted was a little wipe down, I was like, I was looking for the the rag myself, you know, here I'm going off on this, aren't I, I didn't mean to do it, but the reason is because I want our church to be like, because the thing is, you can be in there so much that you forget that it needs to be sorted out, you just get used to it and go, well, that's just the way it is, or it belongs to somebody else to do. That girl had been working there for too long. She was getting paid to clean, couldn't keep her table clean. We asked very nicely and politely, as Americans do. Well, okay. So, keep your church clean. If you see some stuff on the ground, pick it up. If you see something that needs to be cleaned, don't just go tell the usher, hey, there's something that needs to be cleaned. Find a way to clean it. Say, hey, could you loan me the brush so I could brush this, you know, a pan, something, you know, to be able to clean. That would be good. If you work in the nursery or any other place here, we want to make sure that we keep it clean. I was just going to say, keep your church clean, and now I'm preaching about it. But it's important. It's important. It's important. It's important. 1 Kings chapter 17 Tonight, I have uh, fresh milk for you, spiritual milk. I have fresh meat, spiritual meat, for those that can understand that that's what I'm doing. Uh, I have manna for everyone, word from God, God that can help you and feed you. Uh, Sometimes we don't know what manna is, just like the Israelites, they didn't know what is this, that was what manna meant. They didn't know what to do with manna, God had to instruct them. My goal tonight is to be able to speak to you some few things that I don't think are hard to understand, but I think that they're important, and I hope that it's fresh and opens your eyes. I want to speak to you tonight on the subject of the raven, of the raven, praise God. There's an American uh, writer from Boston, old American writer from Boston named Edgar Allan Poe. He's a very macabre kind of uh, grisly kind of writer. Uh, And he had a poem that is far too long in my estimation, but the first line I really love, it says, Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary talking about a raven that was coming and that was the mode that he was in and I think sometimes that's where we're at. So let's read out of the book of 1 Kings verse 17 or chapter 17 verse 1. It says, Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead. I kind of like that. I'd like to have another son and name him Elijah the Tishbite. I wish that from heaven they would say, and you shall name him Elijah the Tishbite. He from now on shall be... Maybe I'll just rename my son that I have 
that as Elijah the Tishbite. Then it says of Tishbe and Gilead. Sometimes when I'm reading the Bible, my mind goes crazy and I do crazy things. Like I was looking at that going, Tishbe and Gilead. I was thinking like posh people saying, yes, we're going to go meet with the Tishbes of Gilead. You know how they are. They're rich. and That's kind of how I had Elijah the Tishbite of the Tishbes of Gilead, you know. Said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither do nor reign these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him. Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Cherith, that is east of of the Jordan. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord God, today that you would minister to us, that you would speak to us. For those who are physically tired, Lord, I pray that you would give them an alertness to receive your word. For those who have grown spiritually dull and hardened in heart, Lord, open them up. For those who need encouragement and strength, we pray that you would bless them. For those who need to be fed, Lord God, feed them with all that you have. I pray that I would decrease, the devil would be bound, and you would be exalted. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ravens are large black birds. I think most of you know that. They're similar to crows. Uh, And the interesting thing about ravens, I think, and this really has nothing to do with my sermon, but I think it's very interesting, is that they're so black that when you look at them, their color almost changes because the depth of the blackness is so deep, and they're actually quite beautiful as you look at them from uh, different angles. I remember years ago, church planting in Liverpool and went to meet this guy who was open to the gospel and invited me over his house, and I'll never forget, he was coming down off heroin, and he (laughs) made me a ham sandwich, you know, wanted to give me a little sani, and uh, gave me some Viscount cookies that first time I'd ever had them, and uh, I just was so touched because he's there, because he's a little bit off, you know, he's a little bit off in his head, but it was enough where he understood what we were talking about. And we sat there as we were eating our sandwiches. And there was a crow that was on the, on the line right outside his window and looked like a massive raven to me. And he goes, them crows, don't like them crows, me. You know, and I remember him saying that. And I, I, still, I still pray for that guy to this day that God would help him. But that's the kind of birds that they are. Actually, they're shrewd birds, very smart. They're not dumb. And uh, you'll remember in the great flood of Genesis how God uh, uh, was able to use a raven because Noah sent a raven out of the ark to look for dry land. As you begin to read through the Bible, not exclusively, but oftentimes uh, the raven is used as a symbol of God's love and care. So oftentimes when you see the raven being used, especially in this text, uh, it is a symbol of God's love and care. I want to tell you that God wants to love you tonight. God wants to care for you tonight. It doesn't matter what you've done. And when we say that, it doesn't mean that there's no repercussions or ramifications of your actions, but it doesn't bind God's love if you've sinned. He still loves you. He still cares for you. He'll still work with you, even though you may have to work through some things. This story here shows the love and the care and the symbolic love and care of God through the raven because God sends the raven. God sends the raven. I know that I'm talking slowly, but I'm trying to get this just to sink in a little bit for you because so many times we just read through the Bible so quickly and we get the gist of the story and that's fine and we do need to get the gist of the story and figure out what it means and how to apply it very quickly. But sometimes as we ponder, there are things that God speaks to us that goes beyond what the text is just bringing out. 
And we shouldn't always be like detectives looking for that, but sometimes we just need to take our time, begin to look at that, see what God is saying. First of all, look at this simple truth that Elijah was in need and the ravens brought him food. Bread and meat, the Bible says. Like many, Elijah was tired at this point of his life. He was exhausted. Many of us can become spiritually exhausted from time to time. Because if you're physically exhausted, all you need is a, is a good night's sleep and maybe a couple of days rest, and boy, you're just back at it and it's, everything's good. But when you're spiritually exhausted, when you've drained yourself of the emotions that are necessary to keep you moving forward in the things of God, that now becomes a worrisome thing. It can become very detrimental to your spiritual health. You begin to open yourself up to things uh, that are not good. You begin to do things you wish you wouldn't things you promise God and others that you would never do. Things happen when people are spiritually exhausted. They're prone to doing things that they normally wouldn't, and they can be given in to discouragement and indifference. They get this attitude that everything's going bad. We're all going to die. It's not going to get any better. Look at what's happening. People can begin to become like this when they're spiritually exhausted. God wasn't going to let that happen to Elijah. God doesn't want it to happen to you, and he's going to make a way. And understand with me tonight that some of the things I'm going to talk about apply to you directly. You, yes, yes, you. You say, well, who, who? You. You. Take it. Receive it. Believe it. Trust it. Pack it in your heart. Don't let it go. God wasn't going to let that happen to Elijah. That's why he sent the raven. Is God sending you a raven? I believe he might. Stick with me here tonight. He brought bread and meat, symbolic of God's word. We know that bread is Jesus, the bread of life. Uh, God sends ravens to bring Jesus. God sends a friend to enlighten us with meat, the meat of God's word, something that we don't already know. Sometimes ravens come not in the form of beautiful birds, but in the form of a friend who is beautiful, in the form of a preacher, in the form of a word from your Bible as you begin to read. God brings spiritual bread and spiritual meat to you and I. It's interesting that he said that this was brought to him in the morning and in the evening. It reminds me of the great devotional written by Charles Spurgeon, the London preacher. He had a devotional named Morning and Evening and has a passage and a story and a commentary for morning time and for the evening time because you need the word in the morning to get you going. You need presence of God in the morning to get you inspired for work or whatever you're doing in the day. But you also need the evening time to wind down as you go and you have your sleep to begin to sleep on the things that God is speaking to you. Morning and evening, bread and meat, Jesus and the Word, morning the evening. Sometimes God is bringing us this, but we're looking for Him to bring something else. We want Him to bring another thing. But I think that God sends the raven to Elijah for a different purpose. And I think he sends ravens to us for different purposes. A little bit deeper. See, the problem with us is we're often not deep enough. See, God is preparing Elijah for the future. He knows what's up ahead. Elijah doesn't know what's up ahead. He just knows he's exhausted. He just knows I have to obey God and I just have to go here. And God's saying, no, 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 I have some things. And as you begin to read uh, in the subsequent chapters, you'll see that Elijah had a job. He had some assignments up ahead. He knew that there were going to be some difficult tasks that await him. Think about this tonight. There are tasks up ahead, not today, not tomorrow, but maybe in a week, maybe a month, a year, or a decade that God has for you. He knows what you need. 
And that's why you're here tonight. That's why God is opening your heart tonight because he wants to speak to you some things this evening uh, to bring uh, life to your life, to bring to you the things that God was bringing to Elijah. He was bringing him conviction and encouragement. He was bringing to him this issue of courage. 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 I know this is a very general, vague term. Encourage is usually thought of of soldiers. Well, that applies to us. We're soldiers in the army of the Lord. Courage is usually something when you're facing something where you have to give your life. Well, that's your, your Christian life. Courage is necessary. You have some tasks that aren't going to be solved through shrewdness. Not going to be solved through more knowledge. It's going to be solved because you're going to have to face them with courage. Huh. Hmm. Courage and conviction. Because sometimes life is just one lar- long, hard slog. A difficult time, difficult seasons, and courage is necessary to face the future without fear. Your future, God, see, see this is what I, I, I think my brothers and sisters miss, is that they just kind of look at their present, and they're either in one of two conditions. They're either in the condition of, well, I'm blessed, praise God, and everything's good, and they're like, yes, just let's ride this wave and stay in this uh, perpetual state of blessedness. Or they're in a place where they're trying to get blessed and things are not working out and they're looking for answers for the present. But very few of God's people are in prayer saying, what's up for tomorrow, God? What do you have for my life in the future? And if you don't hear from him, you continue praying. Because when you have that kind of attitude, when you have that closeness with God, he will send ravens your way to bring you courage that you need not only courage but conviction because Elijah was going to face some very trying times some times where his faith was going to be tested and he needed conviction conviction is a firmly held belief most people when I talk to them about convictions they talk to, them, talk to me like there are some special things, like I have this conviction that I'm not going to watch television where other Christians will watch television. I have this conviction that I'm going to do something different than the rest of the person. I, I, those are fine. And, it, and every person can decide those things that they want to do or not do as long as they're not outside the Word of God. But I want to tell you what we're talking about here is a attitude, not, a, not, a, not an item. It's an attitude of conviction, where you have firmly held beliefs. I believe in Jesus Christ till the day I die. I believe in his word, and whatever I don't understand about his word, it's my fault, not his fault. Whatever I need to understand, I need to dig. It's up to me. The world doesn't have the answers. God does. Those are convictions, convictions that you believe there's a heaven and there's a hell. Convictions that you believe that as you obey God's word, blessings will come, favor will come. Those are convictions, firmly held belief. And every soldier of God needs conviction. Longer-term Christian needs to, uh, longer-term Christians sometimes need to renew their convictions. You need to renew these and begin to reestablish them. And sometimes it just requires writing them out or listing them before God and saying, God, here's what I believe. Here's what I'm struggling to believe. Here's where I'm at. I know this is true, but I'm having trouble. But I'll get there, God. These are convictions, courage, and conviction. That's why Elijah was at a place, because when you're spiritually exhausted, you sometimes throw away your courage and your convictions. You kind of go just for whatever feels good and can make you feel better at the time. And that's dangerous. It's dangerous. Conviction is what pushes us through in the face of adversity. I was reading an article by one of the formal, uh, president of one of the foremost theological seminaries in the east of uh, the United States. And in his article, he was saying that we are facing, un- as Christians all over the world, 
we're facing unprecedented opposition to the gospel. We've always had opposition. We've always had people who hated the gospel. We've always had trouble with governments preaching and establishing churches. All of these things have always been problematic, but not like today. Not like today. You talk with people now, they don't just go, well, that's your belief. I don't believe like that. They're saying, you're evil. You're bad for being a Christian. It's not a good thing. What do you do when you're faced with that? Well, if you come from a background like mine, you want to fight them. That's what you want to do. You want to, you want to get mad and get mean. But that's not good. The question is, is do you have the convictions to say, No, you're wrong, and I'm not evil. Actually, I'm standing for good, and you need what I've got. Do you have that ability in your life? Do you have that conviction that can push you forward? So my point here in talking about God sending the ravens is this, is that sometimes when you're spiritually exhausted, sometimes when you're on the verge of becoming spiritually exhausted, God sends ravens, symbols of his love and care, in order to feed you manna, in order to feed you spiritual food, to give you courage and conviction. Does that make sense? Now here's a question, and this is what I want to challenge you with tonight. Is why do some people get the ravens and others don't? Why do some people get the word from God and others don't? Why is it when you talk with some people and they seem to always say, well, God spoke to me, or I have this, or I'm facing this problem, but I know what to do. Why is it that people are like that? Well, let let me just get this one out of the way. Sometimes they're just lying. Sometimes people are just fakers, you know. They just say things to make themselves look good, but it's really not true. But let's throw those people out of the mix for a minute. What about those who really do always hear from God and always do seem to get a word from God, like Elijah. Why do they get it and others don't? And honestly, it's not always an easy question, and there's no easy answer to it because it's not an exact spiritual science as to why some receive God's love and care in abundance and others don't. There are many factors at play in lives, and on top of that, God is sovereign, God can choose to do what he wants when he wants. Fortunately, he ties himself to his word so we can have some understanding of what he's going to do in a particular situation or circumstance. But always remember in that one of those areas that's in the gray area, kind of vague, he can do what he wants. And we have to make room for that in our hearts. Like, God, if you want me to go through this trial full-blown, then I'll go through it. Because sometimes that's what he wants. Other times he wants to snatch you out of the fire, but he's sovereign. But with all that being said, we can look at Elijah and see what he was like, see what he was doing at the time that led the Lord to the Lord, sending him the sustaining ravens. Because as you look at these, You can begin to emulate them. You can begin to uh, follow after them. You can begin to make them part of your life and your daily care. And it starts with what he said in the beginning of our passage. He starts off by saying this, As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives. As he's speaking to King Ahab, he starts off with these interesting and important words. You can usually tell where a conver- oftentimes tell where a conversation is going by the way people start off. If they start off and saying, oh, I'm going through it, well, you already know where that conversation is going. If they say, well, my boss is really a jerk, you know where that's going to happen. Oh, you know those brothers, they never want to do anything. You know how that's going to go oftentimes. But here we see the exact opposite with Elijah. He starts off with, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, he's alive. He's a living God. He understands that. He believes that. It's part of who he is. Even in his spiritually exhausted state, 
he implies, like I'm saying this, this is my proclamation. The God uh, most high, not the dead God, uh, not the self-serving gods of the world, but the living God. That needs to be kind of our attitude. Sometimes when we're in the midst of trial, we're waiting for a raven. And oh, where is God? And you know, the raven never seems to come because we don't have this attitude. We need to be people who say, I serve the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I serve the one that holds the world together because Colossians says it. He's the glue that keeps things together. And if he can keep the entire universe together, he can keep my life together. He can keep my problem. He can keep my family together. He can keep my wayward children stuck like glue to me. They can run wherever they want, but God's going to hound them. See, that needs to be our attitude. As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, what's your attitude when you're facing trials, when you're spiritually exhausted? Oh, I'm just drained. Then he makes this second statement. He says, the God whom I serve. (laughs) Elijah was a servant of God. Understand, there's a huge ravine between accepting the Lord and serving the Lord. Major gap between those two concepts. I was talking to a brother recently. I've talked to several of you through the last year and a half or so about, you know, my desire is not just to get people to accept the Lord and just feed them milk. I want to challenge them to deeper Christian living. That means there's going to be probably less in that camp than there is in the camp that just accepts the Lord. Because I think that it takes a lot of work to go from just becoming a Christian to becoming a disciple and a servant of God. But that's where he was at. He wasn't interested in just receiving blessings. He said, as surely as the God of Israel lives, the God whom I serve, not the God who needs to be served or should be served or the God that you should serve, but the God who I serve. And I ask you tonight, who do you serve? Who do you serve? And, and I, I know this is the hardcore crowd that comes out on Wednesdays and you know you're committed to a degree more than probably the rest of the, the crew. So you say, well, yeah, I, I, I'm, I don't care about any of that because I know this. I've been coming to church a long time and you can come into church and still not be serving God. You can be coming to church through a mechanical religious routine. <laughs> important. Service to God is daily. It's daily. That's why we have daily disciplines. That's why we have attitudes. The work that you did yesterday was fine. It was good. But what about today? Yes, I know you've put in your time. You've been a Christian for five years, ten years, however long you've been. But what about now? This is a new decade. We're entering into a new time, a new season, a new harvest. New harvest. See how I did that right there? Let's kind of put it right together. It's ongoing, and it costs us something. Sometimes we don't get the ravens because we don't have this attitude that Elijah had, the God whom I serve. If God comes through, praise God. If he doesn't, I still serve him. I've been preaching this for a year, this attitude of just serving him no matter what. Elijah was telling Ahab, I'm on a mission, and this is no light thing. I'm doing something for God. I've been entrusted with a divine duty. That's what he was saying when he says of the God who I serve. It's so important that we have this same attitude that says nothing is going to stand in my way. Nothing is going to stand in my way. If everybody backslides, I won't. If everybody decides to leave, I'm going to stay faithful. If my family doesn't want to back me up, I don't care. I'm going to continue on in the things of God. I'm believing for great things. That needs to be our attitude. Do you believe that what you're doing is your divine duty or your new harvest duty? Because those are two different concepts. I don't even know what new harvest duty is. We only have one duty, and that's divine duty. And if you're not part of that, you're doing something different. 
Then there's a third thing that he says. Why do some get the ravens and some don't? He says, until I give the word. He makes a statement about the drought coming and all of that. And then he says, until I give the word, until I. He uses that personal pronoun, I. A statement like this can come from one of two places in the heart. It can come from a place of arrogance, can it? I, when I say, you, you shall go. When I say it's going to happen, not until I'm done will it happen. Or it can come from a place of confidence, saying God's already spoke. God already knows. This is my position. I'm the leader. I'm the one that God has ordained. And look at when I say the word, that's when it's going to happen. You need confidence. Sometimes we don't receive from God when we need him the most because we have no confidence in God. You allow all your worldly mindsets, your lack of self-worth, uh, your idea that you're not valuable, you've, you, you, you've eradicated all of God's truth from your mind, and now the confidence that should be there is not there, and that's your fault. That's your fault. I know there's a million reasons why, but I'm telling you here, we're talking about why do some receive ravens and some don't often comes down to confidence. Eliza shows that he's not on a personal mission. Why do you serve God? Is it for a personal mission? I mean, I know when we first get saved, it's all about personal reasons. I don't want to go to hell. I have a broken heart. I'm convicted of my sin. There's all of these things that are there, and that's perfectly fine, and that still plays a part at, in some place in our lives. But as we grow in the things of God, as we move from milk to meat to manna, we should be able to say, this is not just my own personal mission. This declaration is not of my own creation. Do what I say because I tell you But Elijah was making it clear. He was God's man. Are you God's man? Are you God's woman? Are we God's church? Because if we are, if you are, and I am, and we are, then we can say without hesitation when I give the word because we have confidence. And then when we're in positions where we've become slightly less than full, when we become a little bit drained or exhausted, God will send a raven, and we won't be just laying on our backs floundering any longer, but now we'll be at a place where we can receive from God. The Bible concludes, and then God sent the ravens. He had this attitude, surely as the Lord God lives, the God in whom I serve. And he speaks and says, when I give the word, because he had confidence in God, in God's word, and what God had spoke, that that's when God sent the ravens. That's when God sent help. Are you lacking help in your life? Maybe your attitude's wrong. God wants to bless you, but he can't send ravens to people who just can't understand what a raven's doing. Because it was more than, and and this, I'm probably gonna put another one down here, but it's probably more than that because he had to get up and move to the brook Cherith, didn't he, before the ravens came. He had to move. I wonder how many of us would move from where we're at, not so much your house geographically, but move from where you're at, your position, your attitude that you've carried about for quite some time, that you'd say, I'm going to move to this place to receive from God. See, these are some deep and heavy questions, important ones. Elijah committed himself to God's work, and then God committed himself to Elijah. I believe that. Beyond the shadow of a doubt, I believe that. You commit yourself to God and his work, he'll commit himself to you, and he'll help you through. God will meet every one of your needs as you begin to do the work of God in your life. Can you say amen? Let's give Jesus a big hand clap today. (laughs) Hallelujah. If you've been blessed or challenged by today's preaching and you'd like to get in touch with us, the easiest way is via our website at www.newharvestuk.com. You can email us at info at newharvestuk.com 
or look us up on Facebook or Twitter. You can call us on 0161 278 6305 or you can even write to us at 194 Chapel Street, Salford, Manchester, M3 6BY. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome for you to join us at any of our services. However you might be feeling, and whatever you might have been told, know this. God loves you, and there's a place for you in his kingdom. God bless you, we're praying for you, and once again, thank you for listening.